Hello everyone, welcome to my presentation. My name is Dr Jane Klossick and I am from the Cass Cities Research Centre at London Metropolitan University. My present presentation today is called Depth Structures in High Street Publics, Socio-Spatial Ordering of Three Case Studies from Tottenham High Road in London. How do we know how to behave in public places? How do we understand how to coordinate our daily lives with the strangers around us? Why is there so little conflict in the super diverse environment of the downhill London High Street or a main street, as it's called in the United States and Canada? The answer to these questions is that there is an underlying socio-spatial structure the depth structure, which helps us make sense of the architectural and spatial arrangement of places. Understanding depth structure enables people occupying or traversing the zones within it to anticipate and understand the behavioural expectations, norms and decorum of each zone. It is a communicative structure. It is implicit and explicit knowledge of the depth structure, which enables people to navigate the complex social landscape of Tottenham High Road in a convivial manner. This paper begins with an overview of the theory of depth structure, which is a new term developed by me in a doctoral study of Tottenham High Road 2011 to 2016. The second section explores the methodology which underpins the study and its architectural methods. The third section discusses the details of three case studies from Tottenham High Road, a hairdressing shop called Crazy Cut, Seven Sisters Market, and a Quaker meeting house. The concluding section embeds the ideas developed in the case studies into the existing and sometimes parallel theoretical context. And this paper has been authored by myself, an academic architect, and it breaks new ground in understanding socio-spatial ordering through concrete examples. A depth structure is a system of so social territories which contains and reproduces knowledge that enables spatial cooperation. Analysis of three case studies revealed that they are organised in a way which demarcates a system of discrete territories or zones with clear thresholds between them and that these co-created configurations structure people's behaviour. The physical expression of depth structures through architecture and objects both creates social life and is created by it. Social behaviour and spatial organisation co-emerge. Depth structure therefore mediates between the physical world of architecture and the knowledge of the individual. Such individual knowledge is embodied or tacit and is externalised by human beings into the built environment in order that it can be shared even amongst strangers using the system of zones and thresholds. So now I'm going to speak about the methodology that I used to undertake this study. Analysis primary through draw, primarily through drawings framed by social science methods made explicit the information encrypted in the built environment and especially exposed information which is usually encoded in architecture or embodied in people. This is a drawing of the Quaker Meeting House, which was embedded deep within the block. As Steiner and Sternberg point out, using their practical and imaginative spatial sense, architects are able to uncover the nuances of the constitutive cultural role of architecture in all its embodying dimensions. I used such a practical and imaginative spatial sense and applied it to the problems of uncovering the typical configurations of block and building depth on Tottenham High Road. I sought to understand their histories and cultures and in particular, the nature of the fit between architecture and social life. A more traditional set of social science approaches was also used including in-depth interviews and participant observation and as a consequence of engaging with the high street settings through these multiple channels depth structure emerged as a form of a grounded theory 
a useful way of configuring the phenomena encountered during the research. While other methods were also employed which generated much data, drawings as the core method and methodology were the route into the creation of depth structure as a theory and tool to analyse the complexity and richness of these high street settings. The encounter with a setting as an architect, making a drawing, gives access to embodied information in the architect and in the other people around, and encoded information in the architecture in a number of ways. The drawing-based methodological approach to the problem of depth structure allowed the temporal, physical and social structures of the case studies to become explicit and to become objects of study. Now I'm going to discuss the analysis of depth structure of the two case studies. Crazy Cut, which is a beauty salon near Bruce Grove in central Tottenham, which is run by a second generation Turkish Cypriot called Oya. And second, Seven Sisters Indoor Market, in which the shops are mostly occupied and run by Latin American traders from Colombia. Crazy Cut is a salon which is a single bay wide, it's about four metres wide, eight metres deep and painted bright orange with an orange sofa, black timber and chrome fittings. There is a large glass window to the front with a full width external canopy and a waiting area with a sofa adjacent to the reception desk where clients enter the salon, gain entry via the gatekeeping receptionist and then wait to be seen sitting on the sofa. In the centre of the salon are the hairdressing and brow shaping chairs and equipment set up in front of wall mounted mirrors, separated from the reception zone by a neatly arranged freestanding shelf with products for sale. That's here. There is a pedicure seat with a foot bath and a nail bar towards the back on the right hand side. At the back of the salon on the left is a hair washing area with two sinks and a staircase which leads up to treatment rooms for waxing and tanning. To the rear, through a door, are a small kitchen and toilet and storeroom, just here. Here, I've colour coded the different zones. In the sofa zone, which is coded in red, the expected activities are arriving and making an appointment, speaking to the receptionist first, who's the gatekeeper, waiting to be seen on the sofa, chatting with the receptionist, reading magazines which are provided, browsing products to buy. You speak quietly, you smile and you look presentable. And who is allowed here? Staff and clients who've signed in at reception. The salon zone, which is blue, the expected activities here are hairdressing, eyebrow styling, chatting in a more informal way than at reception, potentially about more personal topics, such as personal experiences and histories. And here, relationships between staff and clients grow over time. You might speak more loudly and you might remove some clothing, such as your coat. And you probably look messy, for example, if you had hair foils while you were having your hair dyed. Bodily contact for the purposes of hairdressing is permitted. And who is allowed here? Staff and clients, but clients must be invited by the staff. Friends and family of staff may sit here and converse when the staff aren't working. And the crossover between clients and friends happens here where people get to know one, and each, one another. The hair washing zone in green, the expected activities on the salon side are the same as for the salon. But on the other side, the staff conduct hair washing, which is an intimate activity often physically pleasurable for clients. Here also products and mess are stored and this is a staff only zone much like the kitchen and toilet zone which is yellow. Here only private activities take place making phone calls, talking to friends, making and eating lunch and that zone is staff only. There is a gradation of publicness in Crazy Cut between the front and the back. The street is common to all, then the most public zones of the salon are at the front, the waiting area with the sofa and the large window. 
It's slightly less common to all than the street. Members of the public are welcome through the door, provided they then conduct an exchange with Oya or one of her colleagues. The central area where nails are done and hair is dressed is accessible only to those who've engaged in that communication. The back and upstairs parts are the most private and the least common to all. The kitchen is reserved for staff and the upstairs for customers having waxing and tanning, services which involve removing your clothes. The type of decorum expected in each zone is subtly emphasised by decorum indicators shown here in this image. That's the arrangement and organisation of objects. It's particularly noticeable in the arrangement of objects on two shelves in different zones. On the left, the sofa waiting area. On the right, the kitchen, staff only area. The decorum of the object seems to reflect the expected behaviour of occupants in the zone. In the sofa waiting area, the expectation is of a formal sequence of events in which a client enters, meets the receptionist and then is directed appropriately, waiting if necessary. By contrast, the kitchen shelf reflects the private informality of that zone, where a much looser decorum is present and a broader range of activities, including speaking Turkish, is acceptable. Now we'll move on to Seven Sisters Market. This is a picture of the front of the market. It's just a small door next to a shop. The zonal boundaries within the streets and shops inside the market are created and communicated through the strategic placement of objects and semi-temporary -temp structures. Unlike in Crazy Cut, the market does not have a single individual in charge of its layout. Rather, the zonal boundaries have emerged as a result of negotiations between traders. In the photo, it shows a juice bar on the left and a hair salon on the right. The zone of the juice bar's customers is defined by carefully placed chairs, tables and stools. The division between the staff area and the customer area is defined by the bar itself. The zone occupied by those just passing by lies just beyond the stools. On the other side, the zone of the hair salon is defined by seating, although the orientation of this seating means that it could be casually occupied by a passerby if no one was waiting to have their hair cut. In the centre of the picture is a ladder, showing the access to a self-built storage area above another stall. The threshold between the corridor and the storage area is very clearly demarcated by the ladder, as well as the level change. No ordinary passerby would climb the ladder. It's clearly the property of one of the traders. It's obvious that market traders define their territories with carefully placed and oriented objects, and consequently, customers have guidance on the location of zonal boundaries. Here is an image of the sign showing the way to the Quaker Meeting House, which is buried deep inside the block next to a burial ground where the Quakers from 300, the past 300 years are buried and it's above an African restaurant. Just like in the salon and the market, there are zones with different expectations of norms, decorum and behaviour. Here, unlike in the previous examples, the demarcation of the boundaries are much more concretely, concretely expressed by the immovable architectural features of the building. Unlike the market, the Quaker Meeting House was purpose-built and as a consequence walls and doors mark the edges of zones rather than chairs, fridges and hanging garments. Now I'm going to summarise depth structure, which we've observed in those three quite different case studies, and I'm going to say something about its theoretical context. First, the summary of depth structure. A depth structure is composed of multiple discrete zones, each with its own unique decorum, norms and expectations of behaviour. In each zone, the decorum is different and communicated by the people, architecture and objects of that zone, and the decorum changes between adjacent zones.
where zones meet are thresholds, which are the social boundaries defined physically by boundary objects or boundary conditions. The physical delineation of zones and thresholds through architecture serves a communicative function, offering information which allows people to decide whether they are permitted to cross thresholds and the appropriate decorum to adhere to if they do. The communicative function of the architecture which indicates the presence of depth structure serves to externalise social knowledge so it can be shared. So the communicative function of the architecture which indicates the presence of depth structure serves to externalise social knowledge so it can be shared. Social behaviour and spatial organisation co-emerge to create settings which function as holders of social knowledge and the architecture of these settings allows vast numbers of people such as inhabitants on Tottenham High Road to live together in a predominantly convivial manner thanks to the communicative function of the architecture. Depth structure theory brings together core concepts from other authors. It extends them into a useful normative theory. These core concepts include the generative universal socio-spatial structures of the pattern language, Christopher Alexander's canon, and of course of space syntax and their relational theories. The manifestation and communication of boundaries and affordances through architecture are encompassed by these theoretical approaches. Excavating and making explicit the universal structures of space using depth structure theory is useful for theoretical reflection and for empowering practical design and policy choices in a number of ways. Firstly, it extends and deepens architects and theorists' understanding of how appropriate decorum is encoded in and communicated by architecture, allowing for diagnostic socio-spatial analysis. Secondly, it offers a novel and useful methodology and set of terms distinguishing between social boundaries and their physical manifestation. Finally, it provides urban designers and architects with a practical toolkit to help make design decisions such as how and where to express thresholds architecturally. And it offers planning professionals a way of assessing the quality and success of architectural propositions by asking whether the underlying depth structures intended by the designers are fit for purpose and whether they're communicated clearly by the architecture. Depth structure analysis is therefore a normative theory which is both diagnostic and propositional. It pays explicit attention to the emplacement and expression of social boundaries into architecture both in time and space, using close examination of architecture through drawing. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention to my presentation today. I'd be delighted to discuss the content by email or on Twitter. Do contact me at any of the below contact details. That's j.closick at londonmet.ac.uk for my email address. My Twitter handle is at Jane under slash Klossick, C-L-O-S-S-I-C-K. My Instagram is at Cass Cities. And our Cass Cities research group website is www.casscities.co.uk. Thank you so much for listening.